Hey folks, right, this video, it's a Triumph Stag V8. And yeah, before you put in the comments, no, it's not two Dolomite engines welded together. Um, and no, it hasn't overheated, oddly enough. With those two um, pieces of um, fake news, gossip, whatever, out of the way, um, it is a Triumph Stag V8, three litre V8 engine, um, only ever fitted to the Triumph Stag. Sounds absolutely fabulous when they're working. However, this one belongs to a mate of mine, Giles, um, and it has been fighting rebuild. So the issues really started. Giles drove it to Le Mans and back after a number of other um, minor niggles that I managed to fix for him prior to that trip. Um, and on that route, um, it uh, really started blowing oil through the engine, past the, the piston rings and out of the balls. Um, so this video really starts at the point where we had already taken the heads off while the engine was in the car, found that the balls were glazed. Please insert photograph here of the reflection of the piston size on the cylinder wall. Yeah, that's quite shiny, really, isn't it, for an engine that's done just a couple of thousand miles. Um, so there were three cylinders that were really down on compression. Um, and because of that, and because the uh, the bores uh, needed to be honed again, opted to pull the damn thing out of the car. Um, and these observations are what we found. This is Giles' engine out of his stag. 2,000 miles since a full rebuild. One thing I've noticed, first and foremost, at top dead centre, the pistons are coming quite proud of the block surface. Um, probably a couple of thou proud of the block surface. Um, so extra thick head gaskets can be required. Secondly, on top of that, crankshaft's not hardened. It's not been not been tough riding, so we're going to get the crankshaft out next and see what's going on down there. There's been a wealth of loose bolts, loose th this, that and the other. Head gaskets would appear to have been okay though, so I think it's had extra thick head gaskets. You can see how proud that piston is there. Um, so I'm not sure about that. So with the problems that we identified, the machine shop um, graciously, and hats off to CK Engineering, uh, took the engine back um, and sorted the balls out and rebuilt the engine um, for Giles. Um, the root cause of a lot of the problems, specifically the, um, the, the, the cylinder walls, uh, glazing was because Giles had absolutely no concept whatsoever of running an engine in. It's not something you really do on modern cars, is it? Let's face it. It's not really something you've needed to do since the uh, mid-1970s. But anyway, because um, he really um, hadn't been cautious running the engine in, um, it's most likely to have caused the glaze on the cylinder walls, which caused those three cylinders then to, uh, to lose compression dramatically. So... Um, we got the engine back, still had the unhardened crankshaft, um, and I persuaded Giles to get another crankshaft hardened, um, and that was what we were going to fit. So this is the bit where we start up again. Right, I'm here with Giles, fixing his stag. Say hello, Giles. Hello. I've got a dirty face. What on earth is going on there? Who's dirty face? Is that some debt collector? Yeah, I think so. Right, this is a Stag V8 block. Brum, brum. So I've got the crank. Nice bird. It's up there standing next to Giles. Um, and we're going to bolt the crank and put all the pistons in. But before we get there, if any of you have ever painted inside an engine block, please unsubscribe right now. Don't need your sort. But look at this. Fucking paint everywhere. Sorry, I shouldn't swear. I'm in Giles' garage. Yeah, um, I'm a kid's child. And I have cleaned up all round the oil transfer housing, oil filter housing, oil pump housing. And there's the oil transfer housing. I haven't done that yet. Covered in paint. Why? People are mad, aren't they? Right, so I'm going to have to clean up up here, which is where the um, t uh, timing chain tensioners go. Quite why you'd have paint inside an engine, I really don't know. And I've been over it, scratched it. There's so much of it. I'm just going to clean up the gasket faces, clean up the oil pump faces, and I'm probably just going to have to leave the rest inside the block. Um, and we're just going to have to chance the fact that, because there literally is so much of it, and I've got no idea what the paint is. You see, it's painted inside and out. Tony Hart's car. Vision on. Yeah, vision on. Someone's painted it for vision on, we think. Right. 
This is the oil transfer housing that sits above the oil pump and the oil filter. Does it look like a panda's face with the monocle on it? Evil panda. So it's all cleaned up now. Um, been blowing air through all of the oil ways. All of the oil transfer oil pickup, oil filter, oil pump holes are clean. Um, I've cleaned up the holes where the um, timing chain tensions go. The engine's upside down clearly at the moment. So I think what we're going to do now is we're going to put it back together again. Crank in first, check end flow on crank, um, and then take it from there. In main bearings. Yes, these are the main bearings. Um, the main bearing two, sorry, two and four, it's the front of the engine here, are tiny little things. I mean, I'm pretty sure that a one litre A series has got wider main bearings than those. And then the other uh, three journals have a slightly wider bearing, but only just. It's pretty ridiculous, really, isn't it? But that's the way the engine was designed. In fact, you can see there the difference between the, uh, the largest and the smallest. Now, utter cleanliness, obviously. What I'm going to do is use lots of engine oil, and I've also got some um, graphogen engine lube assembly lube here we are this stuff it's quite neat uh, it's just like a running in compound just allows the uh, bearings and the cylinder walls and so forth just to get a bite as they're starting up okay wear gloves when you're using this stuff and obviously i'll be going through clean gloves every time a glove gets dirty i shall be cleaning so case now of laying these bearings into the journal putting the crank in putting the top bearing in the cap bolt the caps up, check the end float on the bearing. The other thing... So done all the um, upper ends of the main bearings, drop the crank on the top, and it turns nice and fluidly. Obviously, there's no end caps on yet, because the next thing I need to do is to put the thrust washers in, and that's where the thrust washers go. And you can see the back and forth movement, and then I need to measure on the front of the crankshaft for end float, and I use a dial gauge to do that. So I got it all in, got the standard thrust washer in there, and uh, I'm measuring the end float on the crankshaft really just by putting the crank backwards and forwards, pulling it back. I've done this with a screwdriver as well, working thousandths of an inch. I've got zero, push it right forwards, and I did get up to about seven thousandths of an inch, which is fine if you want to work in modern money. Pull it back, so we've got zero, push it forwards, and we've got 0.16 of a millimetre, which is well within the tolerances for a standard thrust washer which sits under the centre main bearing. So now we're ready. We're going to torque up, just double check the torque on the main bearing caps and we're going to start putting pistons in. Up us four. I've got the, uh, all of the even number pistons in there so I've got cylinder number one, three, five and seven all in um, and because the journals in these V8s are shared, quite common that, there's only four big end journals so I now need to put the pistons on the other side so we've got cylinder two, four, six, and eight. So these four are going to be next. Now, when you're working with these things, it pays to be over-organized. Um, I've got the crankshaft pulley on the front there because it helps me turn the engine over. Um, I'm using a graphogen compound inside the cylinders and I'm using lots of oil and lube, uh, really just to make sure things um, fit together. So there's the uh, piston with the ring compressor around it, nice and square and straight. Next thing I do is put in the bearing. Now on the comrod end rather than the cap end we just need to put a bearing in there. Oh the packet's not open yet. Let me open up a packet of bearings and drop everything on the floor. Thank you gravity. This lot can all go on the floor in fact it's all contaminated. Now don't mix up clean cloths and dirty cloths because when you wipe your hands um, putting these things together you really don't want to have grit and grime and shit all over the place. This is just all clean, clean, clean. When pushing the bearing in, I, can't, I haven't got my gimbal with me today, what I tend to do is to locate the lug end first and level and then push the other end down and they clip into place. I put a little bit of um, oil, engine oil, underneath it just to assist it going in and a little bit of graphogen on the bearing itself just to assist its bedding in. Now I need to lube up the bore and then we'll tap the piston in and really when I'm tapping the piston in, again double check that we've got the piston pointing forwards. The arrow on the front there, can you see it, can you see it, can you see it? You can, just about there. Um, so the piston needs to point forwards, making sure that the comrod goes in without brushing against the balls and shit. Got the crankshaft turned so that the journal 
it's going to be as far away from it as it possibly can. It's currently right up against it, so I need to turn the crankshaft around so the journal's up here. And then when I push the piston in, um, it can go in to its top dead centre position, but the comrod bolts won't be anywhere near the good journal on the piston. That's the main idea there. So let me crack on with that. So there's the piston in the bore with the piston ring compressor over the top, and the piston's there, you see. And now what I do now is I just very, very gently tap the piston until it comes right the way through. At the moment, the con rod is hanging through there. Um, I lift it, I lift the con rod up and then tap it through, which of course needs two hands. Uh, any resistance whatsoever, anything more than a very, very gentle tap, then something's gone wrong. Take it out, start again. The only thing that can go wrong is this is not tight enough. Um, I've got it as tight as I can get it on this particular piston. So let's see what happens. <clears throat> and then when it's, when it's gone in, you know it's tapped in far enough because this moves around. So that can come off. Just check the insides of it for grit and damage. I'll give that a wipe over and re-oil it before the next one. Right, now, next thing I do is from the other side of the block, you can see the conrod is down there. Okay, there's the conrod. Um, and it's now a case of pushing this forwards. A bit of graphogen between the faces here because these two um, pistons will sit on the same journal and then put the cap on it. In fact, what I might do in this case is rotate the comrod round slightly. So I rotate the crankshaft round to meet the piston. Right, so that's gone in now, and you can see how the two pistons sit on the same big end journal. I've also taken my gloves off, and you can see how clean my hands are. This is how you want to be when you're building an engine up. You really don't want to have grub or grit or shit or anything going in here. Um, every single cap that you put in, you need to make sure it's clean on both sides. Every bearing's got to have just oil on it, no grit or anything like that. Otherwise, this thing will be very, very short-lived. Right, what I need to do now is torque these caps up. So I just torque up the big end bearings. Make sure you've got a decent torque Come wrench. across um, quite a significant issue um, in that a lot of the bearings, and bearing in mind this has been round once, are scagging and marking quite badly. Now these are county bearings. They're not, you know, bad. They're, they're good, good, good quality bearings generally. But you can see on this one it's picked up and it's, it's all sorts of marks and shit all over it. Um, one of them has nipped the ends over. You may see that there. Skag the end. Basically, it's caused by um, the comrods, or the journal for the comrod, the round hole at the end of the comrod being oval, so that not being perfectly round. The crank is perfectly round. We know that the journal's perfectly round. These, however, are original to the engine. I hadn't really considered that these might be a problem. Because I've got one of um, Giles's pistons. This is piston number six. Is it number six? It is number six. Number six, this is one of the ones that um, I was having the most struggles with because it's, it, this one wouldn't even go up to 30 foot-pounds um, on the um, on the thing. So what I've, these ball gauges, these are very, very useful, these. So the idea is that you get them certain capacities and then they, they squeeze in and you use a little knurled nut on the end there to lock it into size. So the way I would measure this is stick it in so it's in there. Tighten it. Um, when you're using a, a, a bore gauge, you want to keep one end in, in, in a fixed location and move the other end around until you get um, a, a reliable measurement. So I'll have to do that one second. It just needs two hands, one to hold one end of the bore gauge. Now I've got that bore gauge, so that is exactly the right diameter for that. Now, if I move this around, I've moved it to... So I did it on that plane there, which is more or less across the middle. I've not gone across the join there. You see I've gone either side of it and that's a nice tight fit. If I now go at a different angle, this thing goes around like a dick in a bucket. Okay, I shouldn't be able to twist it sideways. When it goes here, I can't twist it sideways. But it's in properly. Now it's wedged in. That is not turning. Okay, go to here and measure it and I can twist it sideways. So I can hold one end with my hand and I've got that much play in there, you see? So that indicates that these are not round. And if I go up to here, it's even worse. I mean, obviously, with doing it with two hands and not being on the phone really does help. So these comrods are utterly oval. Um, and this is kind of one of those things, and I guess it's probably the reason why in the workshop manual it says you can do the big end caps up between 30 and 45 foot-pounds. Realistically, you want to do 45 foot-pounds, because why wouldn't you? If I do these up to 45 foot-pounds, then it pinches the bearing too tight, because it's it's too wide here and too tight here. Okay, it's gone oval that way, egg-shaped. Um, and because of that, then, it pinches the sides of the bearings, which is giving me the marks that I can see on the sides of the bearings, or the edges of the bearings, 
Um, and then, of course, at £30, I can turn the engine £45. It's locked solid. And there's two or three com rods that are doing that. Um, I've been through the history um, of the various rebuilds um, on this particular engine. And the last main rebuild, um, there was new pistons, there was uh, reground crank, there was new everything apart from com rods for some reason. I don't really understand why, maybe. Um, because this... But to my mind, uh, and, and looking at the history of the car, the car's done 120,000 miles. These are original stand part com rods. Um, and I've got no reason to disbelieve that these haven't done 120,000 miles, um, which unfortunately is kind of the service life of these comrades. Um, really don't understand why new pistons would have gone on to old comrades, but there it is. Um, and on this one as well, I've still got the rings on it. So let me pause. I've not used the soft jaws on the vice because it's, it's a scrap comrade anyway. Um, just take a bit of paper out there. So the new piston, and these pistons have been decked um, because the um, block was decked as well. And these pistons were sitting proud of the block by about two or three thou. Um, so what I do is the, the comrod moves, sorry, the, the, the piston moves up side to side on the comrod. That's normal. What you want to do is get it up to one of its edges and see if you can feel any play at all. I can feel play in there. Just the slightest bit of play. Tiniest, tiniest, tiniest little bit of play. Now, bear in mind that when you're doing a thousand RPM, this is going up and down a thousand times in a minute. You don't want to have play in here. You really don't. It's just a, it's, it's a worn out small end. And again, it probably was okay. Got a set of recon rods. These are really nice. I'm going to basically fit these onto the pistons. And we're going to have another go. Building this thing down here in Devon. And I'm going to load it in my car and take it back. Um, because I'm down here this weekend. That's getting MOT'd. Blue one on Monday. So I've got this afternoon, Saturday and tomorrow to get this thing finished. I'm not putting the heads on it, I'm just going to do the bottom end um, and get it sealed up. Okay, onwards. Despair sometimes. Right, okay, so um, basically you've got, because we're in a V8, um, you've got, the piston's got a thrust size, so it's got an arrow on the top, but then also the pistons need to, the, the, the journals, sorry, the piston um, comrades need to mate together on the journal. So in effect, they go like that. And you need to have Sorry, they don't go like that. You need to have these faces. That's a flat face, flat face. Okay. That's the way they generally go. So let me, I'm going to stop videoing this because I want to get on and actually build the damn thing. But uh, I wanted to show you the gudgeon pins. The, the, these are fairly new, these, these fellas. Uh, the pistons are fairly new too. They've done about three, maybe 4,000 miles. Um, I'm pushing them back in again. I mean, I'm, I'm going to lube it, but uh, they're just uh, not even an interference fit. In stag engines, doing my pissing head in. These things are not difficult to build. I've sussed up what the problem is anyway. Brand new set of bearings, recon set of com rods, turned the engine over a couple of times. Look at the state on eight, six, four, two. This is the outside edge, the shoulder. So by now, this thing is starting to irritate me. Basically, it had a engine which had been abused through the running-in period, went back to the machine shop, they did their work on it, but sent it back with a um, unhardened crank. If you have a Triumph V8, you really are advised to have the, um, the, the surface hardening on the crank sorted out, otherwise it will just chew its way through the bearings, or the bearings will chew its way through the journals. Um, and really, since... The hardened crank had come back from a very reputable supplier. I won't use any other. Um, I've been kind of having issues. So there were issues with the comrades. Three of them were oval to the extent where they were more than two thou oval and on a 1.7 inch journal. Your tolerance is 1.7 thou. And then a number of the small ends were rattly so it would have tinkled away like a good one, this one, when it was running. So I could justify talking Giles into um, spending more of his hard-earned cash on a complete set of refurbed uh, comrades. And the refurbed comrades had been machined round. Uh, they had new studs, new nuts, new small ends. Beautifully. They went together beautifully. Pistons I knew were new. Uh, new set of piston rings. All going in. Nicely home balls. 
but it wasn't going together properly. Um, and my experience kind of screams at me, there's something wrong with this thing, and I don't know what it is. So I just had to take the crank out. Anyway, enjoy. That's not far off. Right, about there. Let's tighten that up. Take him off. Okay, that sort of goes. Yeah, that's that's a reasonable fit. So what have we got there? We have got oh fuck it now. 7.2 What am I talking about? I have got one point seven there's a two five come up I'm gonna add fifteen onto that so uh, I'm gonna sixteen onto that so twenty five add sixteen is forty one so that is one point seven four well that's right then what the fuck am I doing let me check it my brain wasn't working if I'm doing one point seven oh four then it would have been um I wouldn't have had to do the two five because I'm doing one point seven four I need to dial out to the twenty five which is the first mark after the 7 and then dial in 15 which will give me 1.74 and that actually does fit but the problem I've got with the journals with the, with the bearings is that they're wearing on the edges the outside edges busily working away on this fucking thing right okay stop swearing Richard uh, what I found is that the um, odd numbered um, pistons so we've got one we've got three we've got five and we've got seven are all fit they all work beautifully let me just um tap this gently off its journal there we are notice that instantly as soon as it goes into the number three cylinder position it moves absolutely beautifully and that's torqued up at the moment move it across into the other position i don't want to know so i'm going to remove this now turn it around and put it on the other way around and basically is every same con rod same bearing same journal other end and I cannot fucking move that. Machine shop, like I said yesterday, I didn't get a chance to go out there today. Um, this one. So at this point, I'm thinking, something wrong with these big end journals. Don't know if you picked up the messages there, that the same con rod turns through 180 degrees on its big end journal. That is, doesn't fit one end of, you know, the big end journal, but does the other. Um, so I measured again, and I measured more carefully. Um, and I was not getting the 1.74 thou um, really um, reliably on the even number pistons, the 2468. Um, so I went to the machine shop, CK Motor Engineers, um, and they confirmed it. They said, yeah, this crank has not been ground evenly. So I spoke to the supplier, um, and I guess the important lesson is here, it doesn't matter how trusted your supplier is, people make mistakes. And they took their Half the uh, pistons are in, all of the pistons are in, and it still turns. Oh, okay, I could turn it using the webbing. If the flywheel was on it, I'd definitely be able to turn it, but believe me, it turns, and there it goes. Nowhere near as tight as it was before, works beautifully. So you'll have noticed a couple of things at this stage in the video. First and foremost, it's the morning again. Um, secondly, I've had a shave. <laughs> I couldn't stand it any longer. I think it just gets to that phase where uh, apathy and laziness around having a shave um, just gets too fucking itching. Anyway, the other thing you will have noticed, the most important thing you'll have noticed, is that I assembled this engine with the uh, the even number of pistons first because that was the area I had the problem in last time, um, and that's why I was keen to demonstrate. That the engine was rotating now i don't tend to do a huge amount of videoing while i'm actually building an engine i've got a new tripod coming um, um so hopefully that should allow me to set up the video and uh, and, and work because i like to concentrate on building an engine rather than um, making these videos as much as i love making these videos um <clears throat> so hopefully you will have understood what happened here um that there was a um, engineering issue with the crank uh, that occurred at the machine shop my supplier used not ck motor engineers um, in wickham who've, who've been very very good um, so the machine shop um, had a problem and the supplier was very 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 good at remedying that and communicating with me 
and everything. So it's just the way these things go sometimes. Anyway, um, you won't have seen it here, but the other four pistons went back into the engine and I've got the sump on it. Um, I need to still um, put the rear oil seal and the engine plate on, but that'll all happen this Sunday. Um, I've got some help. We're going to go and put the engine back into the car with its gearbox and clear Giles' garage up a little bit and take some of my crap away um, because it just, it's just so much space. When you start taking engines and gearboxes out and stripping them down, it needs a lot of room. And this project's been going on since November last year. Um, it's been a long time partly because um, Giles has been kind of, you know, dealing with money, family kind of, yeah, his money's been going towards his family rather than towards his cars. It's not been a kind of just throw money at it and keep it going. It's, it's, it's kind of a problem that Giles wasn't expecting. And as we've gone through the project, um, it's kind of evolved and we've had various issues. Um, well, some of them are around old components being reused that were end of life. <clears throat> and I'm a bit challenged by that, but um, apparently that is quite common practice for just to reuse conrods. Um, even though the small ends are shagged out. Well, they weren't shagged out. They're just the slightest bit of play in them. They would have tinkled, though. Um, so, yeah, um, and the crankshaft I got back last week. So, where are we? Um, middle of September. So, beginning of September. 4th of September, I got the crankshaft. That was auction day at Brightwell's. Anyway, it cheered me up getting the crankshaft. Um, so... Yeah, so I got the crankshaft on the 4th, and I built the engine up um, in the following week, uh, which is what you've just watched. And then uh, this Sunday, uh, we're going to drop it back into the car. And I'm hoping we might be able to get it started, although there's still a huge amount of work to do once it's, once it's gone back into the car. I'm putting it back in as a block uh, with the gearbox attached. I'll probably explain a bit better. Oh, sorry, just dropped the camera then. I'll probably explain a bit better when, when we're actually doing the job, but when you put a Triumph Stag engine and gearbox into the car, um, it needs to go in a, an alarming angle, um, and you need a very, very tall crane. Um, and that's really to get the tail end of the gearbox over the front panel. Now, I found a slightly different way of doing that, is where it, basically you present the engine and gearbox horizontally, and once the tail of the gearbox goes over the front panel of the car, then you start to lower the tail of the gearbox down. So it goes in at a shallow angle, getting steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper until it's vertical, well, more or less vertical, um, hanging over the engine bay. Um, but the tail end to the gearbox is about four inches off the floor. Um, then you put a trolley jack underneath the tail end of the gearbox um, and push that back as you're lowering the jack and the whole thing just drops in. Now, the re generally, I do it in about five minutes flat. Um, I'll time lapse it for you. In fact, I won't even bother time lapsing it. I'll just video it. You can sit and watch for five minutes, me swearing at this fucking thing. Anyway, um, the reason I put them in without heads is it takes a huge amount of faff around loading the engine and gearbox into the car. Otherwise, if you, you if you've got the heads fitted, you need to jack the back of the car up quite considerably. Um, it, the back of the car will need to be about a foot off the ground to give you enough clearance for the tail end of the gearbox to go down even lower because the heads obviously will meet up with the bulkhead before the whole st whole lot starts to pivot round. Um, and it does become a spectacular balls ache. Um, I've done it on my car in the past and I've ended up taking front wheels off as well and dropping the front of the car down to the deck and having the back of the car about two foot up in the air. Um, and even then it was a pain in the ass, and I was crushing um, brake lines on the bulkhead and I was knackering um, power steering pipes on the power steering pump and because the engine's in a million bits it doesn't make any sense there's no point building it up and then putting it in I know people do it and I think if you've got the facilities or you've got a four post lift um, or you've got a nice big pit to work with then it makes perfect sense to build the engine up get it tested on the bench um, and then put, put it in um, I haven't got those facilities yet um, so that's really why I will put this engine and gearbox back in as a bare block, well not a bare block, as, 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 a, as a short engine with the gearbox attached to it. <clears throat> and then assemble the heads, get those on, assemble the chains. Um, and then from that point, we should be in a position to actually get the thing started. Now, I need to go over the carburettors 
Um, because when this thing does start up, it needs running in properly, and I want to make sure this thing's not running rich. Um, um, so when I probably, on Sunday, what I'll do is I will take the inlet manifold away, and I'll rebuild and set that up, and I'll do a little video about uh, Stromberg carburetors, and a little bit like Triumph Stag V8s. They're nowhere near as bad as the pub balls would have you think. Um, everyone will tell you, S SUs are far better than Stromberg's. It's a tricky one, really. Um, I work with SUs. I work with Strombergs. I like Strombergs. Um, there's far, far fewer moving parts, especially with the early SUs with the float chamber on the side, with the, with the moving jet and so forth. They, they, I was forever changing those bloody things in my earlier years. Um, Strombergs, you don't really have to replace an awful lot. I mean, a little rubber diaphragm at the top you could do at the roadside if you had to, if they split. Um, and really, when it comes... Anyway, I'm going to talk about Strombergs in another video. I hope you enjoyed this one. It would seem that I am winning the battle with this particular engine um, and would have it running. So part two will be coming along, which is largely around me dropping it into the engine bay and then, I guess, building you know, the heads up and so forth. The heads are already done. I'm just going to drop them straight on with new gaskets, torque them down, um, and then get this car up and running and finished. And it's... Friday the 13th today. You love it, don't you? Um, so it's Friday and it is middle of September. So Giles might actually even get this on the road very, very soon. Um, it's a nice car otherwise. Just deserves a decent engine and I'm going to run the damn thing in for him this time. He's going to take me out for lunch somewhere that's going to be about 250 miles away. Um... So it's just going to be a couple of tanks of fuel and just pottering A and B roads um, and not labouring the engine and just putting 500 miles on it in a day. Um, it seems like a lot of faff, but once that's done, and I'll talk about it a bit more in the next video when we get the engine up and running, but once that has been done, um, and we keep below 2,500 RPM and we don't labour the engine and we keep uh, the speeds varying, we don't kind of uh, mess around um, with... Um, motorways and, and, and you know and stuff like that it needs to be constantly up and down the rev range um really a stag v8 would last generally about a hundred thousand miles and i can hear you in the background they're saying what only a hundred thousand miles this engine was designed in the 1960s in the 1960s things like i don't know the kent engine came out in the ford the little 997 cc engine they lasted 70. only a little four-cylinder engine over square not particularly stressed Engines like the um, 1340 that they stuck in, things like the Ford Classic with the three bearing main crank, you're rebuilding those fucking things every 20,000 miles. So for a V8 to come out and have a 100,000 miles lifespan, that's not bad. Trouble is, the waters are muddied somewhat by the, the ubiquitous Rover V8. Um, and as much as I love a Rover V8, they can be utterly ruined and still sound good. And this is where kind of the, the, the challenge comes in. A Rover V8 will be terminal and still run. A Triumph Stag V8 will have issues. And because the issues often result in expensive rebuilds, things like timing change will start to tick. You want to remedy those really quick. You really don't want to be driving an engine with a ticking timing chain. Um, and th th there's there's a number of other concerns really with 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 the stag engine. I'll probably do a little video on is the stag engine you know the boat anchor that you know the chap down the pub would have you believe because everyone hooked them out, everyone and their brother hooked them out if they knew what they were doing in the 1970s and put a Rover V8 in, or an SX V6 or a Triumph Straight Six, and all of those engines have yeah no problem at all with them. But not everyone hauled Triumph V8s out. And I've not got any issue at all with a stag that's got another engine in it. I just get a little bit irritated. I don't get irritated. I get a little bit amused, because <laughs> it is an amusement, when people come up and tell me, oh, has he got his original engine in it? And half the time I just feel like saying no. I say, oh, and off they walk. But if I say yes, they say, oh, it's overheated then, is it? No, that's Jeremy Clarkson that tells you that crap, not me. <laughs> and then they'll say things like, well, of course, you know, that's two Dolomite engines welded together. Oh, is it? I didn't know that. And you end up with all these bollocks. 
And the stag has got quite a nasty and quite unjustified reputation for unreliability. And a lot of the unreliability has really come out because of poor maintenance. And this isn't meant as a kicking for you, Giles. It really isn't because you didn't understand about running engines in and no one told you because I wasn't on the scene at that point. But um, <clears throat> people don't change the oil every 3,000 miles and then they moan like hell that, you know, it's it's eating the engine. And people don't flush the cooling systems and then they say, it's overheating. They do overheat. If you, if you abuse them, they overheat. Any engine overheats if you abuse it. Rover V8s overheat if you abuse them. Um, and... <sighs> If you don't put antifreeze in or you don't flush the antifreeze out, then, you know, you've got an alloy head and you've got a cast block and you get an electric reaction that takes place between the two and the, the, the cylinder head starts to dissolve very, very gently. But it furs up the radiator because the radiator's got a lot of stuff going on in it and it's got quite narrow channels so it furs the radiator up and then of course the radiator is a bit furred up and the engine starts to run a bit hotter and then yeah the story story goes on and on and on no like you've seen the abuse i give my stag give it you know it it, uh, it it regularly visits the red line it sounds very good at the red line it really does segment. i hope you enjoyed this section thank you for watching this far and listening to my rambling um, and, uh, yeah, next step is coming in the car. We might even get it started. That might be step three, though. Step three might be getting it started. Let's, do, let's go for realistic. We'll get the engine and gearbox back in the car, fit the heads, chains, and then um, I shall do a video on rebuilding the car retters, um, and then step three on this car, on Charles's stag. We'll be getting it started, and then we'll be going through running in. Please subscribe. Thumbs up, thumbs down, as you wish. Loads of comments. I don't buy. I'm quite friendly most of the time. Um, if you want to buy me beer, buy me beer. Um, oh dear, that's about it really. Thanks for watching.